Hello world, this is SpartaCast. Welcome to SpartiCast, brought to you by the Social and Psychological Research on Technology Interaction Effects Lab, the Sparty Lab at Michigan State University. I'm Dr. Robbie Rattan, your host and director of the lab, and this is episode 16, sweet 16, the age when a young podcast blossoms into a... Okay, I don't know. Does the metaphor work? Who knows? 16, the chemical element for sulfur, which is appropriate because I feel very well matched, get it, with our guest today, Dr. Rafael Bocamazzo. Dr. B, he is the Doctor of Psychology, Clinical Director of Take This, an organization that works with game companies on mental health issues. He has a podcast, Champions of Psychology. They're going into their third season. I'm sure they're way beyond uh, their sweet 16, but hopefully we will get way beyond it as well. Thanks in part to this great conversation about mental health in games, a little bit of avatars as an element of mental health in games at the end, um, advice for young scholars interested in this topic, and of course, gamers. Uh, Raphael talks a little bit about his background outside of the the game mental health industry, how he got to it. So I, I find this conversation super fascinating. It is not a run of the mill, like I'm an academic, now I consult with game companies story. Um, no offense to those those of us that do. <laughs> because that's cool too but 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 his story is deeper than that and so so i hope you enjoy it here it is hello dr b i'm super excited to be here with you on sparty cast you are a doctor of psychology and the clinical director you're a podcaster on champions of psychology and you work with game companies on issues of mental health so uh, so that's like the very brief understanding that I have of what you do, but I'm so excited to get to know a bit better about that. Thank you for being here. Happy to be here. It's uh this is awesome. You were you you came well recommended by our mutual friend Dr. Rachel Cowart. Yes, and she was uh, episode 1 for me on this podcast. Yes, she was bragging about that. <laughs> In some ways I was inspired by how wonderful she uh, is able to uh, present her scholarly work on this public forum. I was like, wow, I, I could do a podcast to it <laughs> and, and, and maybe contribute to this area. I, you know, Rachel is, um, Rachel has a lot of just truly amazing talents. I mean, aside from being just a, an absolute world-class researcher and writer, um, she does something I don't think gets emphasized well enough at the, at, at grad school and undergrad level and that's being a good science communicator like there are there are so many researchers that I've talked to that if you ask them to speak to a lay audience they just they falter because they want to give all the nitty-gritty everything because they're so excited as they should be about what they do and they just want to tell everything about it and meanwhile the audience who maybe took a psych 101 class is like huh Exactly. Just like the audience listening to our episode here, they're like, wait a minute, you're talking about Rachel. This, this episode sponsored by Rachel Cower, but, we, but we, we think she's great and she's our connection here. So, um, so we're, we're grateful to her for bringing us together and you work together at Take This, right? We do. We do. Uh, so Rachel is our research director. I am the clinical director. Um, and Take This, when it was founded in 2012, was the very first mental health nonprofit to exclusively serve the game community. And I mean, both the consumer and the industry side. Um, our whole mission for nearly the last 10 years has been destigmatizing mental health challenges and educating on mental wellness policies and practices uh, that uh, both the community and the industry can take heed of. That's amazing. So how did you come to that? <laughs> Um, okay, so my career is weird. All right. I, my career is so weird. Um, I, you know, anybody who's ever done a long series of internships has their supervisor from hell story. And I, I didn't know that amongst my cohort, 
I would be a finalist in that competition, which is a competition nobody ever wants to be entered into. <laughs> but I had an absolutely atrocious intern experience that uh, set me back about six months in my training. And uh, so subsequently, I was a little bit off kilter in terms of the typical academic you know, life cycle. So I either could accelerate everything and get a traditional postdoc or I didn't. So I didn't. And I kind of had to set up my own postdoc as a private practice, a supervised private practice in the Seattle, Washington area, floating about kind of figuring out what I wanted to do with my career because I trained in the prison system and wasn't working in the prison system anymore, despite how much I, I liked working with the guys there. Can you, uh, um, and, sorry, can you say a private practice doing what then? Uh, you know, I mostly ended up working with teens. And a lot of autistic and neurodivergent teens uh, who were incidentally the first to point out that they thought I was autistic, I'm autistic. And at the time, I'm like, no, yeah, they were right. They were totally right. 100% wow. right. So you um, had a degree in psychology and <laughs> it didn't it didn't dawn on you until after you were practicing with teenagers. Well, this, listen, this is why you don't self-diagnose as a, as a clinician, ah. because you don't listen, if you're living in the house, you can't see the exterior. Okay. It's just, you, you are not objective. Interesting. So I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, were you, were you also a gamer at the time? Uh, but, but yes, my whole life. Uh, I actually okay. still have, I still have a framed copy of the first issue of Nintendo power from 1988. Wow. Actually, I have the first 70 issues uh, still on my shelf. I've um, got that. some of those sitting in a box somewhere too. Probably not all <laughs> 70 and not in as good condition to be framed, but that's awesome. Okay, so you're, yeah. you're a gamer, you're a psychologist, you, you come to realize that you have autism um, through your work with these teens. Um, so And also my faltering marriage. I mean, let's not... <laughs> Sure. Okay. So, so many life yeah. circumstances kind of bring you to this point. Um, so go on. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I'm just trying to figure out what my career is going to be because I'm not doing the traditional route at this point. And a friend of mine who I trained with called me up one day and said, Hey, I'm going to be running this really cool new thing. This was in 2014 at Penny Arcade Expo PAX. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, it's the largest series of consumer video game conventions in the world. And it started here in the Seattle area. And she said, hey, we're doing this mental health peer support type room called the AFK room. And immediately I'm like, that's an amazing name. It's with an organization called Take This. And because it's dangerous to go alone, she's like that's their slogan. I'm like, are you kidding? Okay. I got to volunteer for this. <laughs> and I, I, I was never super... got that by the way. Um, that's amazing that <laughs> you figured it out right away. I just now realized, yeah, take this <laughs> dangerous. Go on, go on. We don't use that one anymore. Um, but yeah, that's the origin of what we do. And, um, so yeah, I was super enthusiastic about this and I just asked her how many shifts you want me to volunteer for. And I was there every day of PAX West, or excuse me, PAX Prime at the time, now Max PAX West. And I did the same thing the next year. It was just such a rewarding experience to be able to give back to my gamer community. And by the time the end of 2015 rolled around, after I'd been volunteering for two years, our original clinical director, Dr. Mark Klein, who's still on our board, stepped back because he runs a clinic in the Massachusetts area and couldn't do both. And the management at the time asked, you know, they said, hey, we like you. You speak nerd, you speak shrink. Do you want to interview for the role of clinical director? And I've, I was fairly fresh out of school. I had no management experience, but there was this quote from Richard Branson that was kind of kicking around my head that if you're offered a job opportunity and you don't know if you can do it, say yes, and then figure it out. So I did. And um, I've been with the organization for now nearly six years. Uh, I have done more talks than I can actually remember. Uh, I think I did 38 in 2018 around the country. So how uh, old was the organization in, um, in 2012 when you first encountered them? Well, I, it was 2014. So 2012 oh, is when, when they, when the organization. Oh, opened. I see. Got it. Got it. And, oh, so it was 2014. Yeah. So, found them. yeah so 2014 is when they did the very first AFK rooms, which are these um, probably the thing we're most famous for. At conferences. Is it always yes. at PAX or elsewhere? 
we've done that. We do them elsewhere as well. I mean, obviously not in the last year, but mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we're, we, what's that? Uh, at GDC, the Game Developers Conference. Oh, not we'd so love to do them at GDC. GDC is a stressful event. Oh my goodness. We would love to support people at GDC. So, hey, GDC folks, if you're listening, hey, what's up? <laughs> we got Give you. Give Dr. B a call. We need an we, AFK we got you. room. <laughs> So, uh, so the vision behind Take This um, in 2012 was to kind of grow the way that it's been growing, or has the mission changed as you've watched? Really, it? we've we've had some uh, some massive shifts. Um, obviously, the last year has been huge. Originally, um, the focus I think was more on the consumer side. You know, our our sort of. Our, our, our public community really and the meaning game, you know, uh, the, some of the hot button topics like oh i'm playing video games and they're making me aggressive or i'm like overly <laughs> using games so the aggression thing i mean i think we've discounted that pretty readily um but but the overuse um and kind of uh distribution of of time across games and other things that that's still a major issue right um, well, I, I'm sure Dr. Cowart talked about that. Um, to some extent, uh, though we didn't so go too deeply into it. Yeah. What I will say to that is this, um, because I'm not a researcher, I'm largely parroting what, uh, what she, what she has said and what others said who are, you know, researchers that we know, um, as well as, you know, my own clinical background is that usually when people are talking about addiction, colloquially, they are not meaning clinical addiction. They're talking about a repeated pattern of engaged behaviors. And there are a lot of reasons that people can engage in repetitive patterns of behavior that have zero to do with addiction. Um, I There are certain games because of my autism, I can't play because I will hyper-focus on them. I can't play them while I've got work to do, I should say. Um, Single player RPGs are verboten when when it comes to my work week because I will go down that rabbit hole and I will not look back. I remember the first time I did a a, a gaming training from someone who was a big proponent of game addiction. Um, they they were saying, "And can you believe these people will play for twelve hours straight?" And I'm in the back of the room going, <laughs> "Amateurs." <laughs> uh, Absolutely. And so they. You know, but there's other there's other reasons people can engage in repetitive patterns of behavior, whether it's um, obsessive compulsive behaviors, whether it's hyper focus due to uh, ADHD or autism, uh, whether whether it's an avoidant pattern of behavior for PTSD. There's just so many reasons, and for us to reduce all of these engaged behaviors down to simple addiction, well, not simple addiction, but to reduce them down to a singular cause of addiction is both, I think, reductive and harmful to the nuanced reasons. And uh, when the World Health Organization proposed to include gaming disorder in the ICD-11, there were two dozen very prominent scholars that wrote an open letter to uh, the World Health Organization saying, basically, your criteria are vague. The science is not there to support your criteria yet, and it's reductive. There's so much more that needs to be done to have any sort of conclusion. And one of the things I know Dr. Cowart likes to bring up in terms of uh, when people say, well, there's dopaminergic increases is the fact that um, the dopaminergic increases when people are playing video games are on par of like sex and pizza, whereas meth has a 1200% dopaminergic increase in the brain. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, absolutely. to, to, to so straight it's... up compare video games to drugs. Mm. Absolutely. So, we, so we certainly don't use the term addiction, uh, certainly overuse or hyper-focus sure. can be a problem. And, and uh, regardless of what we call it, it, it was in the, the kind of public discourse early on, but it seems like take this has gone beyond that issue, right? Like it's so much deeper now The the nuance yeah. it's no, it's not a reductive kind of approach to mental health in games uh, and, and not just among game players anymore. Right. Also in representation of men mental health issues within the games themselves. Right. Mm -hmm. And supporting the industry as well. In 2016, we partnered with the international game developers association in their crunch initiative. Um, for those of you who are not as familiar with the nuance of the game industry itself, um, crunch is, I mean, we've all heard of crunch time, especially those of you in school. Sorry, it happens. 
Um, I was there too. Um, but what, what, when we talk about crunch in the game industry, we're talking about regular routine overwork that is usually uncompensated. And roughly one in six developers who are crunching are working more than 70 hours a week. And it's not sustainable. Research doesn't support that it's good. And in fact, research actually shows a correlation between lowered Metacritic scores and regular crunch. So that's something we did to support the industry in 2016. In 2019, we released the first of its kind uh, white paper on the overall mental health state of the game industry. Spoiler, it ain't great. Um, and so, yeah, we do a lot of workshops uh, to support game companies as well. But the icing on the cake is absolutely getting to work with game companies when they say, hey, we're doing mental health themed stories here. We want your commentary. We want to do better. That is just the icing on the cake when they come to us with that. And so in your experience, you, you've been working on uh, the Psychonauts sequel, right? And and you're helping. I, them. I did work on that. Yes, a little bit. Um, and so, yeah. Can you tell us like how, how did you get involved and what did your involvement look like with that? And can you tell I, I us mean, about the it, game a bit too for those unfamiliar? <laughs> so uh, the site. Okay. So Psychonauts is a story about uh, a bunch of a bunch of people within this universe who have psychic powers of various kinds. And the Psychonauts are an agency that specifically trains uh, psychic, you know, in, uh, soldiers, interveners, whatever you want to want to say. Uh, and Psychonauts 2 involves the young uh, Rasputin, aka Raz, as he is initiated into the Psychonauts young training program. And there's some intrigue and some shenanigans and um, the Psychonauts are being threatened by a mole within the organization. And they, they approached us. They, they said, hey, we've been working on this a while and we want to see that if what basically if what we've done is okay. Uh, you know, I came in, uh, Take This came in really at a very late stage in development. Uh, there are some companies that bring us in early, which is, you know what, always what we recommend. Because if you bring us in at a late stage to comment on things, there may be stuff you didn't think about that can't be fixed, that can't be changed at that point. It might be super problematic and it can't be changed. And so um, in the case of Psychonauts, I, you know, I played an abridged playthrough of a pre-release. I gave them my comments and that was that. I look forward to seeing what they incorporated. This game seems highly relevant to issues of mental health. Um, but what about just in general depictions of mental health in games? Um, there's often a negative depiction, mm -hmm. the, the, like the asylum uh, kind of <sighs> element as, as a place to fear. Um, so what, what's being done or, or what do you think could be done to get beyond the stigmatization at the industry level of mental health issues? Um, and, and that's just one piece of it. It's probably a bigger, bigger puzzle. Bring us in early, bring folks like us in early, bring us in throughout the development process. Because, uh, you know, one of the advantages to organizations like Take This is all of our clinical staff, all of our psych staff were gamers. And we, uh, unlike, uh, unlike, sometimes other technical consultants, we understand that there's a balance to be maintained between exciting storytelling and facts. Like we're not going to, we're not going to tell you, Hey, you need to, you need to give a factual account of all the different aspects of schizophrenia to, because there is no one definitive representation you can give. Games are a form of artistic storytelling. And in, in that case, sometimes story needs to be artistically rendered. I would love for the asylum trope to just go away, just absolutely go away, or at least be turned on its head. Because uh, as our community manager, Dr. Kelly Dunlap says, if you wake up in an asylum, do you expect anything good to happen if you're a character in the game? And the answer is probably no, because that's just been ingrained into our mind. I would love to see a game where they just turn that on their head and uh, you wake up in an asylum. It's brightly lit. The nurse comes in. She's cheerful. She gives you a choice of fruit for breakfast and says there's games in the rec room. 
community exercises at 10 May 10 a.m. I, I would love to see where <laughs> it just gets turned on its head. They need you for the trailer, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> um okay yeah so so a couple points in there uh kind of balancing the artistic liberties uh the um the need for engaging narrative and and the factual side of things um and and we often we often praise media that does a good job and it's not just games right like you the stigmatization oh, no. is all over film and television oh absolutely also it's all over the place but but often when we have scientifically accurate uh, like like the Queen's Gambit recently uh, as as a book and that I read and uh, you've heard of it right chess um, well I've heard of it but that's as far as I can go I mean aside from Anya Taylor Joy's fashion sense I really am not familiar with sure with well the, the only reason I bring it up is that uh, that it does a good job of depicting the chess accurately so whereas uh, someone recently was telling me oh does it the film about Bobby Fisher um, you know they just they kind of push their pawns forward for dramatic effect. But if you, if you know chess, it's, it's pointless. Whereas in the queen's gambit, they did, he did a lot of research. This is a metaphor about a game that I'm using <laughs> about mental health and games. So we're mixing a little bit here, but my point is that when your game, great. when your game is scientifically accurate, people will appreciate it more and like it more. Sure. And um, so, so that's one market appeal. The other market appeal, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to like uh, promote the cause here um, because of course it's not just about doing good. It's about the, the bottom line, but I also hypothesize, and you can tell me if, if you think this is right, that games are, often especially games that um that facilitate interaction between characters in these narrative contexts great places for people who have some neurodiversity as you might put it or or you know mental health struggles um to go and simulate social interactions um and otherwise you know engage in real social interactions with their friends while they're online um so if they're struggling or they're thinking about mental health and you're you're promoting positive mental health attitudes, like that will bring more players and probably appeal more strongly to players, right? Do you, do you see evidence for that? Well, I mean, it's, I, I think you hear about this, not just from the mental health perspective, but from anybody who exists within a marginalized population. And let's be real, mental health challenges are still marginalized in this country. We saw comments from Andrew Yang um, on the main stage running for the mayor of New York, who, who had this us versus them mentality as he spoke of those with significant mental health challenges. And he still spoke about uh, those with significant mental health challenges as if they were violent offenders when the overwhelming evidence is that those with mental health challenges, especially significant mental health challenges are more likely to be the victims of violence than the victimizers. And so, you know, any, any non-harmful and even positive representation of a marginalized group is good for society. And it's just, it's just that simple. I mean, what we're trying to stop is we want good storytelling for sure, but it is entirely possible to do good storytelling without punching down at a group that's already been historically marginalized. They gotta, you know, we, I mean, I str I'm, I'm autistic, but subsequently I also struggle with depression, significant anxiety, we've got enough challenges going on. We don't need your further stigmatizing. And if we can help move that needle on a macro level, just one tick, that's awesome. I'd like to do more, but I'm, will but I'm willing to do that kind of one tick impact because that's going to have ripple effects down the line. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I think it's, um, it's a noble cause, but, um, but I also think it, it, it makes sense for society too, right? Like as we as we destigmatize, then um, then more people will be able to engage with each other in these games. Will reduce potential toxicity in games mm -hmm. um, by by encouraging more pro social interactions. I mean, I, I see it as as part of a larger ecosystem about which I think a lot and as uh, as you know also I, I think a lot about avatars so so i gotta throw in one avatar question here um how do you think avatars never saw being... it <laughs> uh, <laughs> not the film um the concept of you know virtual self-representations in games relating to mental health 
Mm-hmm. What um what have you seen? What what's a, a kind of a juxtaposition of um character and, and avatar and mental health? Well, I'll I'll throw myself into the mix here. Um, this so one of the things I do is I'm also an expert on the applied use of role play, tabletop role playing games in clinical and learning settings. I, I teach people periodically how to apply those things. Um, I for years ran social skills groups for largely autistic teens, um, and one of the advantages, and you put it interestingly earlier, um, that that online and gaming social interactions are real social interactions. And for for those of us who might have various cognitive challenges, they offer some advantages, such as the freedom of expression, the freedom of exploration, and all all with uh, behavioral exploration, all within a well-defined and safe framework that is relatively without consequences. Um, One example I'll give is that um, I, I've been playing tabletop role-playing games for, you know, 25 years. And one of the things I realized in my early 20s it was that all of the characters I created for Dungeons & Dragons, let's say, were charismatic, that they were socially uh, smooth. They they understood what was going on around them, and they they could just fast talk. They They were silver-tongued devils, the whole lot of them, just... Charisma was their dump stat. And in my early 20s, I realized that that was coming from someplace, that their in-game behavior had to be coming from me. And what I had been doing for these years is now using this projection of self in a well-defined framework amongst trusted friends to practice the kind of social behaviors I aspired to. And once I realized that, I realized I could do that on outside as well. I could externalize those in-game behaviors into my external life. And, you know, I, ironically, um, for someone who literally has a social disability, uh, my job is, rela- is largely relationship building, mar- uh, networking. I'm about, I'm actually about to, I'm about to, in the near future, give a talk on how to network good <laughs> and and your uh, your d and d characters helped you get to that point, you think? Uh, yeah, I mean, it was it's essentially beha- it was I, I realized it was essentially behavioral practice with mm-hmm. again, within that well-defined framework because you know you think about if, especially for autistic folks, um, we, we we don't like ambiguity by and large, just don't like it, do not like it. And social situations, y'all y- y- y'all are weird. Okay, you, you do things that just make no sense, but you go with it. Like small talk is so weird. Uh-huh. Um, and and th- there's this concept called phatic communication that you say words that the only purpose for those words is as a social marker. Like if you ever go to the grocery store and you talk to the clerk and you say, hi, and they say, fine, you you, they're not responding to your actual words. They're just acknowledging that you exist. And it's a necessary part of the social equation. And it's just so strange to me. And um, yeah, it's <laughs> Absolutely. so, but um, so, so, so there's like a different kind of baseline approach to social interaction um, and through your character development and then your realization. So it's very reflective of you to recognize mm-hmm. that you were Absolutely. doing this with your characters. Most people right. won't do it, but I would hypothesize that actually uh, the characters we use do influence the way we behave. That's the Proteus effect. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but I'm, I, uh, I have heard of it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that's uh, one of my main research areas. And, and I find it fascinating here that unlike in the lab, where we assign someone an avatar that's either, you know, an inventor looking avatar or not. And then they are, we measure their creativity. In this case, you had been using this avatar. You had been assigning yourself to the condition of charismatic. And, and eventually you realize, wait a minute, actually I'm doing this as, as a, a treatment. Uh, you might even call it a self-medication. What do you think? I would, I would call it self-practice and self-actualization. Um, I know our community manager, Dr. Kelly Dunlap, is really big on using self-determination theory and talking about people's needs as they play games. And in my case, the need was to be socially accepted. Related. And I wanted so much to connect with people because of uh, my undiagnosed au- autism. I had been ostracized a good chunk of my life. 
And so um, again, the, the more predictable framework of a game environment allows for one more ready mastery of the in-game skills uh, and, and two just allowed me to explore my needs through that medium. And it was just a, it was a heck of an epiphany when I realized, oh, I can, I can do this there. I, I can do it outside of the game too. Well, I'll be. That's amazing. The power of avatars. Um, <laughs> maybe I'm just hearing what, what I want to hear out of this, but, but I do think that there's a power of avatars in this. Um, and, and it extends, it extends not just into like represent yourself like yourself. It's, it's more than that. It has to do with narrative and character. Um, but I've taken a lot of your time. I want to end with a, a question about the advice you would have for younger listeners earlier in their careers um, to follow your path, to engage with mental health in the games industry um, or, or otherwise, to engage with their own kind of understanding of their own mental health and how that relates to games. What advice do you have for them? I would say be open to new experiences. Um, I am not a licensed clinical psychologist. I trained as a clinician, sure. Uh, but my, my path was a windy and weird one. I volunteered for this organization. I thought I was going to end up working in corrections most of my career, um, but I ended up volunteering. I found this experience that was amazing, and it just so happened to be the right, I was the right person at the right place at the right time, and they hired me for it because it went so in line with my strengths. I, I, hate, I hate doing paperwork. <laughs> And I would have been doing a lot of that working for the government. <laughs> and I love getting, it was either this or become an actor. I, I love getting to perform. I love an audience. And the opportunity that I, the, the, the opportunity to get up and talk to people, to educate people, to speak to large groups, and again, work on a macro level was something I had never considered before. It was offered to me. And I'm glad I took that opportunity. So my advice to all of you is, Try new things in your career. Don't be locked into one path. And, you know, worst thing that worst thing that happens is you like, yeah, I tried it. Not for me. That's great. That's great general advice. Um, and let's say they they love your path, though, even though you didn't quite choose it, they they want to move toward it. Uh, what should they do? Should they uh, go to uh, take this org um, and read you about it? Should they should. check you out at the Dr. B uh, on Twitter? Yeah. Um, well, else? I mean, all means I, you know, take this dot org. You know, you you want to you want to work with take this great. Come chat with us. Um, better yet, and we've got a lot of people who want to work with us. We can't afford to have them work with us because we can't hire a volunteer coordinator. Um, we are much smaller than people think. We've got two full time employees. I'm one of them. And um, so the donations to help us bolster our administrative support go a long way. Um, but yeah, go to takethis.org, follow Take This on all social medias at Take This Org. If you want to follow me, I'm on all social medias at the Dr. B, T H E E D O C T O R B as in boy. Awesome. Thank you, the Dr. B. Also, uh, we can be friends after this, Raphael. <laughs> We can, uh, I, I hope, and and stay in touch. I really appreciate. <laughs> Raphael your... is fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's so great to know you. And um, I'll, I have to say, you're the first person I'm interviewing here who I didn't actually know personally before the interview. Um, G George is the one who who connected us, uh, kind of, and through Rachel. So this, this went really well. It's, it's great to meet someone who's doing something in the field who I didn't know before. And this is kind of why I wanted to do the podcast to expand my network. You're an expert at networking, as you said, maybe ironically, but, um, but I, I really see that as a benefit of this type of work, right? <laughs> I'm an accidental expert at networking. <laughs> awesome. Well, uh, welcome to mine. And, uh, and thank you for including me in yours, Dr. B. Uh, we look forward to meeting you again, maybe on a future podcast. Happy to be here. Happy to come back. Excuse the interruption, but I'd like to provide a brief sponsor message from SpartyCast. Yes, this episode of SpartyCast is brought to you by SpartyCast. Why? Because 
I want you to be our sponsor. I mentioned this in a previous episode and amazingly someone has already requested to be a sponsor TBD uh, when that first episode will come out. But if you have a product, if you have a cause, if you just really want to hear your own name on this episode, um, especially if it relates to games or avatars, let me know. Email me, uh, hit up our team, hit us on any of our tags, SpartyCast on Facebook, Twitter, we're on TikTok now. So any of those modalities will connect you with a member of our team and we will get you into the sponsorship queue trust me we are a cheap mechanism of getting to your audience we want to get this ball rolling so um so we keep prices low and we are happy to include sponsors thank you so much for considering all right that was our episode with dr b i hope you found it as enlightening and interesting as i did Connecting to my personal life, uh, he talked about his mental health struggles and, um, and and the way that people use games as, as a means of socially interacting with others and perhaps dealing with some of their mental health issues. And, you know, we have a lot of anxiety in our household. One of my kids in particular can get very anxious about things, and, and he's also a gamer. And uh, I need to think about ways in which maybe we can craft the game experience or avatar experiences toward helping him deal with those anxieties it's um it's beyond it's beyond the regular kind of whining unhappiness on occasion and so yeah this this episode this conversation helped me realize that i should think a little bit more about games and mental health in my own household um and, and maybe not just when we're dealing with anxiety and outbursts of, of elementary age kids, maybe also um, as, as a means of kind of getting closely connected to my friends and family members. We do have, I mean, mental health issues are often compounded by loneliness and isolation. We are out of the pandemic, uh, quarantining, of course, but uh, for the most part, not of course, I mean, not everywhere in the world, um, but we are still isolated in many ways. And so we, we are now looking forward to a post-pandemic future and games might be able to add some social lubrication to, to these experiences that are unfamiliar to us and help us maybe get over some of the, the loneliness we've been feeling. So that is that is one personal takeaway I had. Hope you enjoyed the episode. Thank you for listening. If you like what you heard, please subscribe, follow, download, tell your mom and dad and neighbor and gamer friend, uh, cousin, dog, etc. Our producers are the amazing George McNeil and Taylor Halterman. Thank you for listening to SpartyCast. Hope to see you next time. Thank you for tuning into SpartyCast. Goodbye, world.